All right, now that we know uh, why elliptic curves are important in cryptography, we have seen the, the group operations and how we can you know, perform addition on the points of an elliptic curve. It is now a good time to talk about how we can use it. So I'm going to talk about elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. So it is the actually the analog of digital signature algorithm on elliptic curve. So our operations instead of on uh, numbers will be on uh, elliptic curve points. So the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, ECDSA, is the elliptic curve analog of the DSA. So almost every cryptocurrency uses this algorithm. Recently, Bitcoin added Schnorr signatures uh, so that instead of this, you can Schnorr signatures also. ECDSA was first proposed in 1992 by Scott Vanston in response to NIST request for public comments on their first proposal for digital signature standards. It was accepted in 1998 as an ISO, uh, as an ANSI standard, as an IEEE standard, and also FIP standards. It is also included in many standards in the last two decades. decades. So uh, you can see that actually elliptic curve digital signature algorithm is very famous. And now people trying to uh, move on from digital signature algorithm to this. So uh, last time when I talk about digital signature algorithms, I uh, show you a quotation from uh, NIST documentation, which tells you that they are not going to include digital signature algorithm in their new document, but for backward compatibility, they suggest you to go to previous standards. So most probably we will move, uh, no longer use digital signature algorithm for some time and instead use elliptic curve digital signature algorithms. So it starts with choosing domain parameters. This is very important. The domain parameters of an elliptic curve digital signature algorithm consist of a suitably chosen elliptic curve E defined over a finite field FQ of characteristic P. By characteristic P, we mean that if this is P to the power something. So here P is the prime number. You can either choose Q equals to P or you know you can choose q equals to two to the power m. In that scenario, your characteristic becomes two. You choose a base point on this elliptic curve. Domain parameters may either be shared by a group of entities or specific to a single user. So go, let's go back to Bitcoin and Ethereum. Here I show you the domain parameter. So it was valid for everybody. Everybody was using this also now currently using the same domain parameters. They choose different points on the curve so that they can you know, choose their private keys and public keys and so on. So you can either choose a new curve or to communicate with somebody else, but you can first define these parameters and everybody can use them. So the domain parameters uh, of uh, for elliptic curve digital signature algorithm comprise of a field size Q where either Q equals to a prime p, a not prime, or q equals to 2 to the n. An indication field representation of the representation used for the elements of q, because you can actually represent these elements in different ways, like maybe you can use a fine coordinates, polar coordinates, and so on. Optionally, a bit string seed e of length at least 256 bits if the elliptic curve was generated in accordance with random generation methods. Okay. Generally, you can use random curves or you can use a curve from the standard. So if you are generating it randomly, then you have this optional uh, seed value so that everybody can follow the same steps and generate the same elliptic curve. Two field elements A and B in FQ, which define the equation of the elliptic curve E over FQ. Recall that we define the elliptic curve like this. So A and B actually define our elliptic curve when the P is odd prime. But if we uh, focus on Q equals to two to the a, M case, then the definition of the elliptic curve is somewhat different. Here, as you can see, we don't have plus X, Y, but in this scenario we have, and here is, it is A, X, here is A, X, K. So the definition of the elliptic curve depends on the field you are working on, okay? 
Two field elements X, G, and Y, G in FQ, which define a finite point G of prime order in, e, in this uh, elliptic curve. So this will be our generator point. The order N of the point G with N equals N is larger than this number and also larger than this, you know, so that we, it can provide 128 bit security. The cofactor is also calculated like this, and this H number is somewhat important when we define an elliptic curve. So these are domain parameters. So you define it before. I showed you how it is, uh, you know, how it is the case for Bitcoin or Ethereum. So once you have these domain parameters, now you can generate your keys and, you know, uh, start signing messages. So an ECDSA key pair is associated with a particular set of EC domain parameters, which we explained in the previous slide. The public key is a random multiple of the uh, base point, while the private key is the integer used to generate the multiple. So in other words, you choose a random number and you add the base point to itself that many times and obtain your public key. An entity A's key pair is associated with a particular set of elliptic curve domain parameters as defined like this. But again, if you use the same domain parameters for everybody, then instead of focusing on all of these values, you can simply focus on your public key. This association can be assured cryptographically, for example, with certificates or by context. For example, all entities use the same domain parameter. So in the case of cryptocurrencies, this is the case. We fix the elliptic curve once, domain parameters, and then we use it. The entity A must have the assurance that the domain parameters are valid prior to key generation. So this is very, very important because we, in our documentation, in our papers, we always say that you have to check the domain parameters. But last semester, when I was teaching uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency technologies, this happened. As you can see, this is a, a the, uh, from OpenSSL Security Advisory from 15th of March 2022. And there was a very important bug. So it's you can look at the CVE with this number. As you can see, the severity is high. And actually the problem was that there was an infinite loop in BN mode square root function, uh, which actually happens. You can create an infinite loop when parsing certificates. The idea is as follows. This uh, square root modular function, which computes a modular square root, contains a bug that can cause it to loop forever for non-prime moduli. Internally, this function is used when parsing certificates that contain elliptic curve public keys in compressed form or explicit elliptic curve parameters with a base point encoded in compressed form. It is possible to trigger the infinite loop by crafting a certificate that has invalid explicit curve parameters. So this is what we are talking about. So if this, if you don't check if the parameters are valid or not, this function creates an uh, infinite loop. And in the uh, OpenSSL implementation, they weren't checking the domain parameters as we mentioned here prior to key generation or validation, okay? Since certificate parsing happens prior to verification of the certificate signature, any process that parses an external supply certificate may thus be subject to a denial of service attack because since you are, you know, uh, go into an infinite loop, your CPU cycles will be busy, so you actually create a denial of service attack. The infinite loop can also be reached when parsing crafted private keys as they can contain explicit elliptic curve parameters. So in order to summarize, vulnerable situations include TLS clients consuming cert or certificates, TLS servers consuming client certificates, hosting providers taking certificates or private keys from customers, Certificate authorities parsing certification requests from subscribers. Anything as which parses ASM1 elliptic curve parameters. This is just a kind of an encoding. Also, any other application that uses this function where the attacker can control the parameter values are vulnerable to this denial of service attack. So as you can see, you have to check the parameters first, then perform operations on it. This is the main idea. 
So uh, that idea, this thing were explained in maybe 10 years ago or 20 years ago, but we still see a bug in 2022, okay? So you have to check your parameters. So assume that we check your parameters, the domain parameters are correct. Now you want to create your uh, key pair. So this means that for cryptocurrencies, you are creating a uh, you know Bitcoin or Ethereum address. So it works like this: when you pr uh, press to create a, a Bitcoin account, or if you want to use this digital signature for signing something else, what you do is as follows: you randomly select an integer d between one and n minus one. Of course, choosing one sh should not be suggested. You compute d times g, which gives you the point q. So recall that g is our base point, which is defined in the uh, domain parameters. You randomly chose d. So you are actually adding g to itself d many times. And this is actually a fast operation. And you obtain a point at the end q. So q will be your public key. D will be your private key, as it is also written here. So you might ask that if I know the Q, the point, which is your public key, and G is the base point, now I need to capture D. So is this problem easy? Actually, this is the discrete logarithm problem for elliptic curves. To sign a message M, an entity A with domain parameters and associated key pair does the following. Uh, you For signing each message, you have to still select a random integer k, okay? And this should be kept secret. If you publicly announce, if you sign something and then say that I sign it with this random value, then your uh, private key leaks. This is very important. Moreover, for different messages, you have to use different k's. If you use the same number k here to sign two different messages, your private key also leaks, which happened in many Bitcoin accounts because the random number generator was, there was a bug in Java in Android. So some people uh, sent Bitcoins to two different address. So they had two transactions using the same key. So their uh, private key got captured and people uh, stole their Bitcoins. So let's go back to signature generation. So you randomly uh, generate an um, integer K, then compute K times G. So you are adding the base point G to itself K many times and convert the coordinate x1 to an integer. Recall that this x1 is a field element. You turn it into integer. These conversions are explained in the ANSYS standards. Then you compute this integer modulo n to obtain r. If r equals to zero, then this doesn't work. You go back and choose another k. If it is not zero, you compute inverse of k modulo n Recall that k is the number you choose it initially. Then you compute the hash of your message. Recall that signing the message itself is not practical. This is why we always hash the message and then sign it. So you have to choose a, a proper hash function and convert this bit string to an integer e. And you then compute e plus dr. Recall that d is your uh, private key multiplied with k inverse, which you calculated here, and obtain a value s. If s is zero, then you have to repeat this process. If it is not, recall that now you obtained two different values, r and s. Actually, this is your signature for the message m. So it looks like very similar to digital signature algorithm, but this time operations are performed on elliptic curve points. This is why you have to convert the field elements to integers and so on. So once you sign the message m, you produce r and s. Okay, so in a you know cryptocurrency transaction, this is your signature. Then everybody can verify it and realize that you really you are the one who signed this message. So in the terms of cryptocurrencies, you everybody is convinced that you had those uh, cryptocurrency initially, and you are transferring it to somebody else. So verification. You receive the signature RS and the message that signed. So now B wants to, you know, uh, check if this is really signed by A. So B also obtains the domain parameters. Again, if it is fixed, everybody knows this value. Again, we recommend that B also validates D and Q, okay? 
So you I'd be first checks if the domain parameters are correct. So if there's really an elliptic curve like this, then they check if Q is really a public key, which means that it is a point on the elliptic curve. Okay. We are saying this because if you don't do this, then you go back and the so the open SSL bug, which you know creates an infinite loop. Okay. Once we verified this, then B starts doing uh, calculations. So they verify that R and S are integers in this interval. You might think that, okay, this is obvious, but sometimes people don't check it and there are many buggy implementations. So please do not skip trivial steps, okay? This is important. B now computes the hash of M and converted this into a bit string E, then computes S inverse modulo N, S is for coming from the signature, then computes E times W and R times W. Again, R is from signature. So obtain two different values, U1 and U2. Then compute the point X, which is actually U1 G plus U2 Q. So as you can see, these capital letters are actual points on the elliptic curve. So G is the base point. Q is the public key of the signer A. So U1 and U2 are the values you obtained here. So you add these two points and obtain a point on the elliptic curve. So if this point is the point at infinity, then you reject the signature. Otherwise, you convert the x coordinate of this point, which is x1, to an integer x1 bar and compute modulo n value of it. You end up with a value v. So you accept the signature if and only if v equals to r. Okay. Of course, you might ask why this works, but we actually uh, went through the steps when we talk about digital signature algorithm, uh, but it comes from you know, Q being D times G, okay? D is the private key of A, which we don't know, but the verification works. So this way you verify the signature. Yeah, here why the verification works. If a signature RS on a message M was indeed generated by A, then, S equals to this value because this is how A calculated it with their secret key, right? Rearranging these values gives actually, you know, multiply both sides with K and then take, send the also multiplied with S inverse. You end up with K is equal to S inverse this. Then, you know, due to the associativity property of groups, you obtain this. But this is actually W and W and D and which is u1 and u2 d modulo n. So that's actually we realized that u1 g plus u2 q actually gives you k times g. So v equals to r as required. So this is why the verification actually works.